Dan Deshear. I'm an assistant professor and extension plant pathologist with um, Alabama Cooperative Extension. I have a wide range of crop responsibilities, but I'm mainly going to focus on turf grass diseases today, but I'm also your point of contact for ornamentals and some row crops as well. Uh, so the main thing I wanted to talk about was fungicide application considerations to manage turf grass diseases. Uh, you know, as things are starting to green up, um, we're getting a lot more phone calls in the landscape about managing for turf grass diseases. Um, you know, getting starting to get some phone calls about patch diseases in turf as well as dollar spot. And of course, on golf courses, they're always continuously intensively managing for a lot of these diseases as well. So why do we even need to talk about fungicides? Well, if you look at our commercial um, turf grass IPM guide for diseases in turf, you'll see that there, this thing is a huge document with several fungicides listed. Um, and so it can be quite daunting when you're trying to think about what type of fungicide you need for what type of disease. And really with fungicides, um, you know, they, they account for a good input of your production budget, especially on golf course maintenance. It's about 13% in total maintenance costs. And so it's important when you're thinking about fungicides is what are they used for? You know, they're primarily used to control diseases either by suppressing or slowing growth of that fungal pathogen itself or preventing the fungus from reproducing on your turf grass. It's important to note that they're not going to promote turf grass growth as a whole. You know, so you really have to and intensively manage turf or really damage turf. You need to look at the system as a whole. Um, nitrogen fertilization rates are really important, especially during the spring when you start getting green up. You know, a lot of people want to put a lot of uh, fertilizer out on their lawns, some herbicides as well. And so you need to do other things to kind of promote the growth of that turf. Um, fungicides are only active against a limited group of fungi. Um, so it's important in turf grass selection, um, especially with narrow spectrum fungicides, um, to know what diseases you have and then choose the right fungicide accordingly. So instead of focusing you know, on the turf grass diseases, I've done webinars on those before. Um, so feel free to check those out for more information. Um, I believe they're all kind of posted up on our website or um, Facebook in our archives as well as YouTube, but I mainly wanted to go over the fungicide basics and what the categories of fungicides are, um, different considerations when selecting fungicides to manage diseases as a whole. And so it's important to know that there's kind of two main types um, for fungicides in turf grass management. You have contacts, which are considered protectants. So based on this figure, you can see those contacts don't move through the plant tissue. They just are on the surface of the plant versus systemics, which are going to move through the plant tissue. And there's different categories of systemics. Um, some may just locally penetrate, you know, on the, the leaf blade. Some actually may, you know, flow through the vascular tissue. So it's important to note when to use a protectant versus a penetrant. So for your contacts, you know, that's just provides just a general barrier that's applied to the leaf and stem surfaces of turf grass. Um, it's most likely gonna be used for foliar disease control. It's not really gonna have much efficacy against a soil borne pathogen like take all root rot. Um, and essentially it just prevents one or more steps on that host surface so the fungus can't enter or infect the plant. A lot of these are gonna be more broad spectrum. You know, something um, like chlorothalonil is gonna be more broad spectrum and works more um, best as kind of a protectant or provide pre applied preventatively. Um, and it's important to note with these that they're only active as long as they remain on the plant surface. Um, and they have to remain on that plant surface at a sufficient concentration to inhibit that fungal growth. So that new growth is not going to be protected. So a lot of times you have to do repeated applications um, at a regular scheduling interval, um, and you need to get thorough coverage. Uh, so you want to make sure you're applying that according to the label to make sure that everything in the area that you're trying to protect is actually getting that adequate coverage. So any new fungus that enters the plant after that residual activity is kind of gone. And if you don't do that repeated application, that fungus is not going to be affected by that, that fungicide. 
So systemic fungicides, um, a lot of the turf grass fungicides are kind of moving more towards this. They typically have a more specific mode of action. They're more narrow spectrum. And since they're more narrow spectrum, it's a little bit easier to get those um, through the EPA process and labeled um, for use, not only on turf, but other crops as well. These chemicals will you know, penetrate the plant surfaces and they're moved within, you know, typically within the vascular tissue. Um, they can be used against foliar and root pathogens. They generally have a combination of kind of curative and protective properties with that extended residual activity. So versus protectants, you know, with a curative, you may not have to, you know, apply it as often um, versus the preventative fungicides, as long as you follow the, the label directions. So they can control fungi that have already entered the plant and initiated in, infection and give you a little bit of curative action there. They can also inhibit fungi that are coming into the plant that are new, right, from initiating um, disease. So that's the preventative action there as well. So there's also, um, in addition to that, there's additional types of fungicides. There's a couple that are considered local penetrants. Uh, you know, then these just kind of penetrate the plant surface, just maybe in short distances right at that leaf tissue. Um, but a majority of that fungicide is still going to remain on or near the plant surface. They're best considered as preventative fungicides, which include hyperbidione or vinzaclozin. So 26GT is probably your best example for that. There is a new group of fungicides that includes um, triloxysterbrin, which is compass, which is a mesosystemic, um, which it just really has a strong adherence to that plant surface. And then it is absorbed by the waxy layers, but it's not a true penetrant in that sense. And so that's still going to work best as a preventative. So you may be wondering why I went through and gave you a lesson on different fungicide types. Um, it really comes in terms of recovery process of turf. So one is going to be, you know, once you see a disease, um, that recovery process is going to be governed by the type of fungicide that you're applying. Also, of course, the environment, fertility, and cultivation. We have to continue to manage the turf, try to keep it, you know, from getting stressed and more prone to infection. Um, and sometimes excessive nitrogen uh, levels can um, increase your risk for disease or too little nitrogen or some of your other micronutrients as well. And also, you know, cultural practices. But if you're looking just strictly at a fungicide point of view, this was a study that was done at an NC State where they wanted to see the curative suppression of dollar spot with fungicides. And so you have five different fungicides. You have Secure, which is in the, the blue bar, Dacanil, which is green, Chipco, um, which is that kind of local penetrant, in red, and you have Maxtema and Prosterity. And one of the things that you'll notice is that um, depending on the type of fungicide like Dacanil, that's going to be work best um, and secure applied more preventatively. They aren't systemic, so you're not really going to get that curative action like you're going to see with Maxtema, Chipco, and Posterity. And so these were all applied at the same time on May 13th, and they followed this through through two weeks, so they did not do a repeated application. You can see within that first week, all the fungicides are doing very well compared to that non-treated control, but then your protection kind of start to fall off towards the tail end of there where you still get some more bang for your buck, um, you know, with those more curative type fungicides. And so the main takeaway from these is that you have to be patient also with recovery. You know, it's not going to be immediate. It's going to take, you know, a couple weeks at least um, and maybe some repeated applications. And those contact fungicides are not going to give you those curative actions as we saw from the, that, that graph. Um, and Dacanil and Secure are going to work best when applied preventatively, um, you know, so you can do that maybe when you're most at risk for disease. And then if you do see that disease to start to develop a little bit more, then go in with a more um, different mode of action or a more of a penetrant fungicide um, to give you that extra control there to gain that recovery of that turf. So in terms of fungicide basics, most of our fungicide failures are really either due to misidentification of the problem. So a lot of times, um, you know, and this is more true for some homeowners where they see damage in the turf, they get really um, nervous about it and they throw everything in their arsenal. Um, you know, a lot of fertility issues can be confused sometimes with plant diseases. So if it is a fertility issue, 
um, or maybe you just have poorly drained soil, a fungicide application isn't going to help with that. So you're not going to see that recovery. Also, sometimes misapplying a fungicide, whether it's a coverage issue, not watering it in, or not selecting the right fungicide for the proper disease can also be an issue. Um, in terms of um, failures, I wanted to highlight that a lot of these chemicals, sometimes, you know, people want to add additives to kind of improve, um, you know, the adherence or coverage of a fungicide. Don't add these additives like a surfactant um, to these fungicides unless the label says so, because you're not going to see you know, a, a benefit from that. Sometimes it can have an adverse effect where you get an increase in phytotoxicity. Um, fertilizer solutions should typically be applied separately and shouldn't be mixed or tank mixed with those fungicides. This is especially true for any fungicides like mancozeb, phosphiel, or chlorothalonil that has zinc. They contain metals. Um, and so a lot of times, if you don't determine compatibility first, you can actually get some adverse reactions to that turf and make the problem worse. So sticking on the topic of you know, fungicide failures and properly identifying the, the problem, uh, this graph is just to represent that different fungicides with different mode of actions are going to have different activities on different plant diseases. So a lot of your OMI seeds like Pythium blight or yellow tuft, you have very specific fungicides that have activity against those. A lot of your SDHIs, DMIs, or QOIs are not going to have activity against those OMI seeds. Um, and you'll, you'll see that you know, DMIs have pretty good broad spectrum activity against several plant diseases. Some of your SDHIs are going to be a little bit more specific to something like dollar spot or gray leaf spot um, and some of your um, patch diseases as well. The other reason why I wanted to bring up different types of fungicides, and I specifically mentioned your DMIs and QOIs, these are single site fungicides. As I mentioned, a lot of these systemics have very narrow spectrum in terms of activity. And that, while it's good for you know, the fact of the environment where you have less um, environmental toxicity issues, you know, less um, potential where, for it to be a human carcinogen or um, you know, activity against aquatic organisms, it makes them more at risk for fungicide resistance development. And that's because they target one specific pathway or target site in that fungus. And so all it takes is a few genetic mutations for it to overcome that. And so it's important when you're applying fungicides is to rotate with multiple modes of action or incorporate a broad spectrum like chlorothalonil into a spray program if you have to do repeated applications. So there is fungicide resistance known in the turf grass pathogens, um, dollar spot, gray leaf spot, and then thracnose and pythium blight all have known resistance to different fungicides. Uh, you know, DMIs and QOIs are going to be most at risk. So that includes your benzimidinediol, um, propiconazole, strobiurins, um, also theophonic methyl, as well as menifaxum. Um, and so all of these, we do know that there is resistance to them. And so typically on those labels, it will tell you, you know, you can, you're only limited to maybe one or two applications before you need to rotate to a different fungicide with a different mode of action. So it's important not to rely solely on fungicides for disease control. Do those other things that, you know, like Dave Hahn and Scott McElroy, you know, promote in terms of promoting overall turf graph health you know, avoid using highly susceptible turf grass varieties, um, you know, and there's some diseases like take all in St. Augustine. Sometimes you have to completely renovate those lawns, go away from St. Augustine when you go back into that. Um, limit the number of fungicide applications of those at-risk fungicides and alternate with those different frac groups. More recently, to kind of help combat some of this fungicide resistance, we've moved to from just single active ingredients to fungicide products that contain multiple um, you know, active ingredients with different modes of action. And so that's really kind of changed over the last decade. And more than two dozen combination products are currently on the market. These are gonna broaden your spectrum of activity, increase your efficacy and help with that resistant management. And I don't expect you to memorize this table, but it's just to show you that, you know, we have, um, you know, something like Xteris that has a QOI and SDHI. So those frac groups 11 and 7. And so as long as you see those different numbers there, that means that they're a different mode of action. And so it makes it really easy um, when you're looking at a label. It's one of the 
things that's always at the top or kind of right hand corner of those labels. So going back to when to use a fungicide. Um, so keeping all of that in mind now that you know how to kind of alternate with different um, frac groups, when to use a preventative versus a curative. Preventative applications are perfectly fine to do as long as you know what type of diseases are likely to occur at that particular time. Um, you know, with turf grass diseases, they typically happen at the same time every year. And I have a slide on that, um, a couple slides from now, that'll kind of show when you're going to see the damage. Um, and it's just important to remember that if you don't have or haven't seen issues in that lawn in a pass or on your, your um, golf course, you may not need to do a preventative application. It just all depends if what kind of variety you have, um, if it's zoysia or bent grass um, for certain diseases. They should only be used when absolutely necessary. Um, you know, lawn disease in one location does not mean it'll occur on adjacent landscapes. So cultivar and environment are gonna be your primary factors in disease development. And that all goes back to that plant disease triangle where we have to have the pathogen present at the right time of year with that favorable environment and that susceptible host has to be there. So environmental conditions are going to strongly influence your turf grass disease development. You know, brown patch requires wet, humid conditions during warm to hot weather. Um, you know, dollar spot likes a little bit more overcast, um, kind of just prolonged periods of leaf wetness. And also microenvironments can affect disease development. You know, one side of the building may have its own microenvironment that's influenced by trees or other buildings that are around that or bodies of water and soil types. So sometimes it's perfectly acceptable to do spot treatments. It just depends on that particular situation. So here's just kind of a summary slide of when we're most likely going to see some of these diseases. You'll notice that brown patch, dollar spot, and spring dead spot we see in the spring and fall. Gray leaf spot we start to see in the summer um, and fall as well, whereas take all root rot we see kind of in spring and summer. So if you just kind of remember what time of year you typically see these diseases, that can kind of help govern if you feel like you need to do a preventative application before this kind of starts to develop. So it's also important to note a couple other things that I just want to cover before ending my talk. Um, think about when you're going to apply fungicides. You don't want to apply fungicides when it's too cold or too hot. Um, sometimes that can influence adverse reactions for those fungicides. So typically, you know, temperatures between 60 degrees and, um, and 85 degrees Fahrenheit kind of give you the best results with the lowest risk for phytotoxicity um, development. You also don't wanna apply fungicides to turf that's stressed either by drought or temperature before or at the time of application. If the turf is stressed, it may um, kind of adversely re react to those fungicides. Probably the biggest takeaway, and I wanted to really end with this, is coverage. Um, coverage is gonna govern your efficacy. Um, you wanna make sure you're looking at those labels um, you know, select the proper nozzle, sprayer, and pressure to ensure those adequate coverage. Um, you know, definitely keep track of the weather. You know, you know, we're entering in a time where we kind of have a lot of afternoon showers. So when you apply a fungicide, you want to make sure it's at least allowed to dry on that surface for at least six hours um, to make sure it doesn't get washed off um, for that product to properly adhere. And some of your fungicides need to also be watered in, especially if you're trying to get good efficacy against more of a soil-borne pathogen. Usually one gallon of water per thousand square feet should give you adequate coverage um, in addition to that. And I hope everyone knows this, do not apply fungicides when conditions are windy, you will get drift. And so that fungicide is not gonna go where you want it. It may end up on other parts of the landscape where that fungicide is not really adequate for those particular plants in that landscape. And I know that was a lot to cover in a short period of time. I do wanna say, if you're not sure what plant disease you have, um, feel free to contact me if it's turf grass related. The Plant Diagnostic Lab is also an excellent resource. When you're looking at fungicides for selection, our commercial turf and lawns disease and nematode control recommendations is a great resource. I update this yearly. If you also wanna look for efficacy data, um, there is a publication put out um, by the University of Kentucky in, 
um, in addition to the University of Wisconsin and Rutgers, where they list the different fungicide active ingredients and in terms of efficacy. So it's a great resource to make sure you're selecting the, the proper fungicide there.